This podcast is for informational purposes only. Please speak to a qualified tax professional about your specific circumstances before acting upon any of the information provided. So hi everyone and welcome to episode three of Crypto Tax Sucks. This episode is all about NFTs. Just to backtrack on the previous episode, we covered DeFi and we were joined by Joe David from Minor Accountants and also Tom Wardle from Swapsicle. Uh, We covered things like collateralized loans, um, staking assets that have dropped in value. Um, We looked at things like, is DeFi the way forward and beneficial ownership? Um, So feel free to go back to the episode to find out more. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be some crossover in this episode. As I mentioned, this one's all about NFTs and I'm joined um, by two really great guests today. Really excited to have them on. Um, So we've got Andy Gray, um, who is one of the founders of Known Origin, um, a digital art marketplace that has recently been acquired by eBay. Um, So massive achievement for Andy um, in being acquired by eBay um, and looking forward to what's next. Um, And we've also got Ben on as well. So Ben Lee is partner at PK Francis Clark. Um, He's also a self-confessed tax nerd um, and DGen of all things crypto and NFTs. Um, And I kind of put Ben on this pedestal of of, being one of the best crypto accountants in the UK. So um, we like to keep the bar high on this show of crypto crypto accountants. (laughs) It's very kind. (laughs) I I didn't ever do it too much though, did did I Ben? No, I mean, hopefully it's going to filter out my blushing, but I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Are you both well? How are you doing? Yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. Bad, Tad chilly, but all good. Surviving tax season. Just about seven, seven, I was going to say seven days left, but we've, we've, we've lost one. Six days left. Six days left to the deadline now. So uh, yeah. just about. Just got a pair of <laughs> cool so i'm gonna i'm gonna start off by asking uh a question that i love to ask accountants and it's why crypto tax sucks um so it'd be good to get your good to get your your view of this ben okay um why does it suck does it suck i guess it sucks i mean tax sucks in general right um uh, it'd be wonderful to not have tax but here we are um why does it suck um i think for a number of things at the moment it's just very complicated isn't it you know uh what you've got is you've got a lot of people out there who are i'd say taking advantage or interested by um this new area um and unfortunately uh, you know things aren't particularly clear to the individual taxpayer is actually what the implications of what they are doing might be um so there's a lot, you know, people like yourselves and we are doing around that sort of education piece. And sometimes we're actually, you know, that can only go so far because there's not enough clarity to even define what the outcome might be. Um, and this isn't sort of like, oh, I've just bought a house or sold a house and there's one transaction. You can have thousands of transactions here. So um, there's a lot to consider um, and there's a lot still yet to come. I'm sure one of the things that we'll touch on uh, in this episode will be uh, VAT. Um, hopefully that doesn't make people stop listening straight away there's more exciting stuff than that on this i'm sure um but there's lots of things to come out and talk around about that um so that kind of sucks but um unless i'm just a, an incredibly dark person it's kind of why i love it as well so i, I love it because it sucks because it's it's um it's changing it's evolving and it's quite an interesting area to uh, to keep up with cool yeah appreciate that um, andy how do, how do you feel about it yeah well for starters, I'm not actually an accountant. I'm, I'm a software developer by trade, but I have uh, become quite familiar with tax. I think the problem with crypto tax in some ways is that it's still evolving, you know, and, and from a business perspective and a personal perspective of a collector or a seller, you often start small and then grow and then it, it, it's not really a problem, then it becomes a problem. And then the interpretation of it is just different depending on who you speak to. So in my opinion, uh, all our artists and all our collectors and most people I speak to want to be pay the taxes and want to understand their obligations. But because of the misunderstandings and miscommunication and interpretations, no one can get a clear picture. So often people then avoid it because they may not understand what is required of them 
to actually file a, a correct report. So it's tricky, you know, people just want that magical tool or, or someone to be able to tell them definitively. And unfortunately, no one can right now. Yeah, I mean, in some respects, we want to be that magical tool that helps everybody. Um, but there's, there's kind of limitations from our perspective of what we could do, because we need clarity in order to kind of guide people through the right way of paying their taxes. So I, it's kind of like, what, what, what's the answer to this? Is it, is it more guidance from HMRC? Proactive guidance? Um, do we need legislative change? Um, what, what, what's the answer? So I well, guess I've got quite smart. Oh, sorry, Andy, you go. Well, no, I'll start by, I mean, I'm obviously biased. I, I don't think more legislation is the answer, but I think more mm. opening things up uh, to have a more global tax system, you know, jurisdiction based tax systems are difficult in cryptocurrency. So we really want a, a level playing field because as a business, we want to, you know, work globally with, you know, within reason with everyone we can. But the tax system, you know, mm. it's, it was built around small businesses who, who are in a fish and chip shop, you know, in a town and all the customers are from that place and that, and that the value doesn't cross borders. So it, I understand it's tricky, um, but um, hopefully over time, you know, this economy will evolve and, and we'll get better, but I have no idea how that problem can be solved. Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, I might, I guess I might disagree with Andy there just on the legislative piece it's you know we've got tax tax incentivizes or disincentivizes economic activity you know that's a it's a tool for that as well as many other things and you've seen how some jurisdictions have used it as a tool to incentivize particularly um you know the undertaking of digital asset businesses in in, in their countries um either with like a flat rate of tax like slovenia for example or um just sort of no tax approach uh, in other jurisdictions so um that then makes it hard, as Andy was saying, to be sort of, you know, competitive on a global scale as in terms of where you might wish to undertake business. Mm. And the problem here is that what we've got is we've got a new, effectively a new type of property, you know, what the Law Commission are doing in terms of saying, well, hang on a minute, we've got a new, a new, a new property here, a digital property. Um, and we are obviously just trying to understand how it fits in with current legislation. And, and, and I'm sure you've probably touched on this previously, but it's that is where things are creaking and it's not really working because it's so new in the way that we're using it makes it very difficult to fit in with what we already have because what we're doing is going that's not a currency so um you know we're basically bartering with assets on a scale we've never seen before and the tax system wasn't really designed to cope with it so for clarity if there was specific legislation built around you know law that is yet to be derived around what digital assets are then that would give more comfort for people who are, who are trying to undertake, you know, business in the UK and hopefully globally, because we'd have a better understanding of the process. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you're on the money there, to be honest. I mean, just referencing the law commission's um, paper that they released in July, um, they're kind of saying that digital assets do fit in existing property law at the moment, but there are so many nuances around the asset class. This is an asset yeah. class we've never seen before. That there can't be, there's, there needs to be specific legislation to support the industry moving forward. So, you know, we're not, we're not even at a point yet where the Law Commission has, has defined exactly what needs to be done from a legislative perspective. But we seem to be very, very strict on what should be taxed and shouldn't be taxed from a guidance perspective at the moment, um, which I don't know is a bit, it could be a bit contradictory. Um, but I suppose they're just they're just trying to make sure there's no kind of get out of jail card from paying your taxes perspective. Yeah, of course. And, and think of the cost of having to write a piece of legislation to govern a asset class that is new. Uh, you're not going to do that before. Actually, from a legal perspective, we understand truly what it is and what defines that, because otherwise you're going to have to go and rewrite everything, aren't you? So um, and I think, you know, what combining the question with what sucks is the industry is you know the pace of the industry is phenomenal it's i'm sure anyone involved with it um experiences and obviously you know our current uh, systems tax law and everything else it's such a 
trial to have to try and keep up with it it's it's you know will we get to a place where we have to find something that happened five years ago but actually we're, we're on from that now you know it's that's that's the the difficult ask yeah i think the the classification is a, is a struggle as well i mean yeah for me it's like good. obviously cryptocurrency most people think it's a currency but it's not it's classified as an asset you know so then you have to do additional KYC requirements digital assets feel like an asset you know an NFT could feel like an asset but is it classified so it's it, you know it's really hard to get the tax and understand where you are when you can't really understand the thing you're working with so we've got to get like that basic understanding of what a cryptocurrency is you know and and, and you know how it fits in this current system yeah it's difficult i mean we we work in this area full time right and we can struggle to kind of keep up and try and get the understanding that we need to run our businesses so it's like how how does the average nft creator navigate this um and you know if you do hit any kind of complexities around vat or regulations you're just going to base yourself offshore right you're just going to go somewhere <laughs> where there's where there's not a problem you just remove that productivity drain and just get on with running your business. So are you guys seeing that? Because that, that is something that we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of people in the NFT space that have gone BVI, Dubai, wherever, um, just to simplify things. Yeah, it's it's clarity, right? We, we come back to the confusion <clears throat> and the lack of clarity in this space. Um, now with all of that uncertainty around the regulatory aspects, um, and certainly some of the tax aspects, um, you know, you're seeing offshoring, not, you know, if we rule around the clock about 10 years, you're not offshoring for tax purposes. It is. It's just to try and get business done. Um, and where jurisdictions are offering clarity over that, it's making it far easier to go offshore and, 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 and conduct your business than it is to stay onshore. Yeah. And I th for me, it's like, because of the way tax and capital gains, particularly, and then I think the misunderstanding for a lot of people is when they're moving stuff around is these taxable events happening and, and that's a realization that comes over time people don't realize it at the time so with offshoring and stuff you're reducing that risk of retrospective action in some ways because you may be doing a lot of stuff that you don't realize now or in the future and you don't really you know that legislation is going to come and there's going to be different scenarios so why do you want to take the risk in the worst case scenario because the worst thing that could happen i think with with this is fear you fear that something's going to happen so you stop doing business you stop innovation you stop trading you stop buying nfts but that's not what we're trying to achieve tax shouldn't no one's going to win in that scenario absolutely yeah i agree with that yeah i mean it's it's just such a productivity drain. I find so you, you've got the educational barrier to get past to understand, you know, perhaps what you need to do, and you've got to find that clarity, and you've got to really find it right. We all know that, you know, there's a lot of accountants and tax advisors out there, but how many of them actually have, you know, done the hundred hours on crypto assets? How many of them have an interest in it? Um, it's difficult to find that right advice, and then once you have found that right advice, what you have to put in place in your business or, you know, even as an individual to manage your tax position um, can be incredibly burdensome. Um, you know, we've, we've recently just had a, a client who's a doctor and she's talking about um, taking two days off of, you know, effectively stopping people from dying to do her taxes. Um, so, yeah. you know, it's, it's naturally just going to move to offshoring or people that have made any kind of significant wealth are just going to disappear from the UK just to remove themselves from that pain point um, until we've got that, that level of clarity um, where it, yeah, it's just simple. There's not a, yeah, so there's not a time efficient or necessarily a cost efficient method of staying on top of this and analysing it for tax purposes for taxpayers. You know, certainly for some, obviously, if you've only got a few transactions, OK, that's relatively yeah. simple. But what we're seeing more and more of and what will happen over time is those transactions will build up and some you know, clients who are um, you know, thoroughly in this space, actually, the, the, the time and the cost to actually resolve the tax position is, is astronomical for the taxpayer, which is not mm. efficient. 
Yeah, yeah. This might be a good time to kind of break into like the the different cohorts of people that are involved in NFTs and maybe what taxes they need to pay from like a a general principles perspective. Um, so if I if I'm a just an NFT investor and I'm buying an NFT, um, what are the taxable events related related to that? All of the events. All of them. <laughs> so, if you're, so obviously, if you're buying, the thing is, what, what we've got to look at is, is the different assets. So let's say I hold ETH and I'm buying yeah. an NFT. What I'm doing is I'm disposing of some ETH and then I'm buying an NFT, which is an entirely different token. So from a tax perspective, I've disposed of an asset to reacquire another asset. So I've got a tax point, potentially, depending on what, you know, as and when, what value my ETH might be. And then I acquire an NFT. And then, then looking to sell that NFT, I've got another tax point based on the gain or loss that I might have made on that NFT when I'm converting that back, or I say converting, exchanging it for a different type of digital asset. And as an investor, that's going to fall within capital gains tax. That that all sounds pretty straightforward, right? People people can kind of <laughs> that sure, people can kind of like understand the basis of that, right? You've got one asset, you're turning it into something else, you're then turning that asset into something else. You know, it's it, it, where you become like maybe a creator, where things get more complicated. Um, Andy, Andy, what do you what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the Ben scenario, just to touch on that, it's tricky when you've bought ETH a year ago, and then it's appreciated. And then obviously you make your NFT and then you don't realize you've got a taxable event on the appreciation of the ETH because it feels like you're just using your money to buy something. So I think that's that can be the confusion or if it's gone down, that there could be a loss. So and this is why you see unusual scenarios where people will they'll sell a punk and rebuy the punk for the same value, you know, to because there's technical reasons to do that, to, to get losses. But from a creator perspective, going back to the original question, it's it's interesting for them because they can have uh, sales revenue on, on selling NFTs, but they can also have recurring royalty revenue. So they often may have like a constant drip or, you know, depending on how popular they are of, of, of money dripping into their accounts all the time from, from multiple sources, multiple marketplaces, multiple contracts. And then what we found with creators, they just want to be able to manage um, the beauty of blockchain is that it's totally transparent, but what often happens is people are working with many marketplaces that all have different levels of, of reports you can pull off. So they're having to pull data in from everywhere, maybe across multiple chains. Creators may be on Ethereum, maybe working on different marketplaces on Tezos, whatever. They may be on Wax, they may be on some uh, uh, more custodial marketplaces that do actual US dollar or other fiat checkouts. So they've got this like, before you know it, you know, they want to maximize their creativity. So they go across multiple chairs, multiple platforms, but then they have to <laughs> bring all that data into one place and then actually process it, which makes it really difficult. And as you say, they want to be a creator. They don't want to be an accountant. I wanted to be like a build NFT platforms, but I end up having to understand a lot of this because it becomes part of your job. But what we want to do really is as an industry is make that easier, you know, and I think there's certain tools and certain reports, but there's not standardization yet across how you can pull that in. And, you know, mm. artists don't want to be spending all year worrying about this stuff. Yeah. And, it, and, and going back to your point there, Dan, it's all about structuring, isn't it? Because if you're a creator and you're selling this as part of a business, then as Andy said, it comes within income. If I was a sole trader and I'm selling, that's income tax. If I'm doing it within a company, it's revenue, it's corporation tax. And it's funny, you know, you said, yeah, we can get our heads around that disposal of ETH and purchasing an NFT. But I guess if you're living in the ecosystem, you just wouldn't really perhaps consider that to be a disposal. Like I always use that old analogy of like, I don't know why, um, but like a 1980s fairground, like I go in there and I give them 20 quid and I get tokens and I can use my tokens on their machines. Maybe I'll win more tokens or whatever else. But in the end, I cash out and go home. Um, and if you're just within that environment, you might not consider, you might be like, well, hang on a minute. I've just spent... I don't know, some matic on a polygon at it or something along those lines. It's all within it's all within the system rather than thinking actually no, that's a completely separate asset that you've purchased. 
Um, yeah. And I think, again, that sort of feeds into the confusion. And I think, like, as a, as a general collector, you you may have bought an NFT, say you bought a Doodle, it's gone up from 2 ETH to, like, 8 ETH. You then sell it in OpenSea for 8 ETH, and then you just go and buy something else for 8 ETH. People think, well, that's great, you know, I've got £8 back, I'll go and spend my £8. And, that, that, you know, but really, you've, you know, in, in a simplistic way, you've only got 80% of that if you want to, you know, put some away. But people, you know, that's the problem. If you're constantly trading and, and moving stuff around, it feels good. But then you're just creating this trail of, of, of admin and, and taxable events. And I think once people understand that, they'll be fine with it. You almost need to know that, you know, in an ideal world, if, if you know, some of these marketplaces could almost send it to your, like, tax account, you know, and then send you the profit to make it easier for you. So at the end of the year, you've got this pile of money that, you know, that's ready for that. But, you know, as humans and, and it, before crypto, no one thought like that anyhow. So but people have got to get that in the mind to just, just avoid the pain, you know. It's fun, you know, buying and selling NFTs, but, you know, having liabilities that you, you can't afford isn't fun. So it's just education, really. Yeah, and I guess that's, if there's anything we've learned from the last year with what's happened with the markets, you know, one of the things I always talk to, to, to clients around is obviously that liquidity piece, because even as a creator, if I've, if I've been very successful and I've, and I've sold out on my project, um, but then I've just kept everything in, uh, an asset that unfortunately has then devalued during that time. Well, you're going to have tax bills based on what you'd originally, you know, brought in the market value of those assets as and when things were sold, because that's when that, that's how it's recognised for tax purposes. But actually, you might only have fifty percent of that value left in what you're holding. Um, and these are all sort of general. We've been seeing that so much in the last year, for, from both a sort of a creator's perspective as well as an investor's perspective feeding into what Andy was saying then about just carrying on down the chain because you just keep going. And I think there's a de degenerate behaviour because obviously when ETH's when it's going up, it feels like you're winning twice. But obviously when it's going down, you're losing twice. Whereas from an individual perspective in a business, you've got to get comfortable with stable coins because that's what's going to help you. Because, you know, everyone's got their own uh, attitude towards risk. But then I think if you don't put anything into stable coins, your attitude to risk is quite extreme because you can't predict the future. And I think some people are very good with that and some either don't understand it or just keep like to ride the wave and just hope things will be okay. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of think you hit the nail on the head with the whole kind of just, just tracking everything and understanding your tax position. And it's, it's, there's just this massive disconnect, right? You can have fun in the market, but you've just got no, unless, unless you're really on top of things, you've just got no understanding of the, the impact on your tax position. Um, I mean, that is something that we are generally trying to, to trying to do at recap, you know, we've got this new dashboard and we can show you your crypto net worth. Um, we can show you your estimated tax bill. Um, but there are limits to that. There are multiple chains. There are, you know, there's, there's still a, a misunderstanding of if you're moving assets between different chains, is that a disposal or is that a transfer? Um, the, there's limits to where this can go without tax clarity. Um, so as long as the market is moving ahead at like, you know, a lightning fast pace, there's always going to be a lag time of how quickly we can catch up to actually support people because it is just such an incredibly fast paced market. Um, but we, we are, we are kind of getting there, but we're kind of relying on maybe HMRC, um, to, to put out, you know, guidance that so where, where they're actually on top of things like this, right? You know, we, we've seen a market for the last three years of NFTs but we've had no NFT guidance as yet. Um, so the quicker they react, the quicker we can react and the quicker we can help customers, the quicker we can educate them and the quicker we can make them, you know, understand the tax position, give them that clarity so they can continue playing around in this market and keep on top of their tax position. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think, and I think the like, sorry, Ben. Sorry, Ben. I mean, I think on that, I think from the government's perspective and legislation, they've got to make crypto assets not like, they've got to make them a, a first class citizen or make, give people confidence that it's okay to do this. I think if they keep treating it as like a, a shadow activity, you know, a secondary economy, mm. then people start acting like that towards the tax. 
It's like everyone's allowed to have confidence that it's fine to hold crypto, it's fine to own NFTs, it's fine to do stuff for them, and it's fine to pay the taxes. So I think there's a responsibility of of them to really promote the industry in a positive way because if they keep bringing out like retrospective actions, and I know in the U US there was some OFAC regulations on tornado cash. It's just pushing everyone underground. So for me, as, as working in the industry from a, a business perspective, I want to see them more positive on this to make people comfortable that it's okay. People, I don't, individuals shouldn't be afraid to put crypto gains on their, you know, on their self-assessments. It's not a flag that you're like doing some, you know, doing some nefarious activity. And I think that's the, the positivity that needs to be driven by uh, jurisdiction and obviously all the legislation that's needed. Yeah, and I, and I think to just support what you said there, Andy, about people not being afraid as as an advisor within this space, actually, where HMRC have looked and inquired into people's affairs that have had cryptocurrency, actually, you know, it's not with this, it's not with a uh, almost prejudgmental opinion that there is something nefarious going on. And actually, they've been very receptive to certainly the work that we've done to help the taxpayers to try and get it right within the boundaries of what we can ascertain at this point in time, depending on you know, on, on, on whatever case that might be. Um, I think the difficulty for people as well is that this, the lack of guidance in this space doesn't stop the assumption that this already somehow fits within pre-existing legislation. And as we've said before, creators want to create. I can't imagine they want to go and pick up the VAT Act and read it from start to finish to try and get their own understanding of how that might apply to what they're doing. And that's a real risk for, for people at the moment. And that's why you're around, Ben, right? To help with <laughs> this. Exactly. Yes, because I do like reading the VAT Act from start to finish. Somebody has to, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, exactly. But it, but it is, right? It's, it's, if anything, people like myself and other advisors in this space are here to keep up to date with what is going on, see what's happening within the industry, try and disseminate that information so that we can advise um, people to the best of our ability what's going on what they can do about it and, and how to do the right thing because what we find is most people want to do that mm. yeah yeah i kind of want to i kind of want to backtrack on the the whole kind of like positivity piece that andy mentioned like it, it it does seem that uk government kind of realizes that this is a major game-changing technology and they've got this ambition for us to be a crypto hub but the kind of um, every, everything we're kind of hearing out of that narrative is all regulation based. We're going to regulate this. We're going to we're going to produce this to, to kind of support the industry to bring crypto businesses here. No one's kind of addressing or seeing the bigger p picture that tax is probably the major issue. If you've got a really bad tax regime or a lack of tax clarity, it doesn't matter if you've brought down those regulatory barriers. You have no customers if people aren't going to invest in the industry or be afraid to invest in the industry. So I think, I think tax needs to be, you know, it, it almost goes over and above and beyond the whole kind of regulatory issues that we have in the UK. You sort the tax issues out, you actually create a thriving, you know, crypto asset economy here in the UK. Um, and regulations should be second, probably secondary to that. Like it's, it's, it's this idea and I'm sure they're aware of it. But, you know, this isn't a classic, I'm going to set up a business, right, what do I need? A premises, right, then I need staff. Um, in a world that we live in, certainly post-pandemic, where you've got the likes of digital nomads that can pick up their laptop, go somewhere else, live there indefinitely and carry on doing what they're doing, that's the real risk to, as you say, the, this being the, the you know, a place for this tech to thrive, which is what they said in April. Uh, last year when they came out and said that they want it and, and oh, obviously I'm a cynic um, because I'm just not a very happy person because I've chosen to be an accountant for my life but it's that sense of well okay what perhaps benefits what benefits the UK and and the difficulty we're having with NFTs is uh, the the guidance and the work it feels that HMRC were doing around this has then become lower down the ladder because obviously we've been focusing on DeFi because we released the guidance second country in the world to do that oh but now we're going to go back and review it now there's a call for evidence we're very focused on that when the NFT market is huge and there's lots happening over here but there's just probably not the time resources or ministerial 
appetite perhaps to get moving with this in, in a way that actually does benefit creators in this space no i i can i completely agree with that um it's it's like the time and resources for us to be a crypto hub just need to be more focused on the tax side of things than the regulatory side that's where the opportunity is this is this is where we're seeing a hollowing out of our of our industry because as you say you pick up your laptop you jump on a plane to dubai or wherever and you're you're outside of the scope of uk taxation if you follow the right rules um and that's what we we've seen a lot of that this year um people just kind of removing themselves from the yeah, headache of it all. Absolutely. <clears throat> cool. Yeah. I think um, from my perspective on that though, Dan, is it's not as, I mean, not everyone can just leave the country. And then if you're working in NFTs yeah. and crypto in the UK, as a business or an individual, uh, I think the utopia that, you know, you know, you can pay for everything with cryptocurrency and you don't have to touch real fear is, is impossible. So like if you're trying to be an individual or run a business, you've still got to pay your bills, you've got to pay for your house or pay for your business and stuff like that. So it needs to be fixed because, you know, we're not going to move everybody to these these safe havens. It's, it suits a few people, but in the end, like a company like ours running Manchester in the UK, we've got a lot of people there and, you know, we need to convert, you know, crypto to fiat. We need to pay people. We need to manage our books, manage our taxes. So it needs to be fixed, and, and I know like different jurisdictions, there's a flight race to help people, but we need everyone to be on board because we shouldn't have to force people to go and live in a different country to work in a brand new innovative industry. Totally agree with you on that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so I'm going to move on to some uh questions just around the market and I, I don't want to get into like speculation of like price and things um but we've we've obviously seen like an explosion in in nfts over the last three years um if not four years actually and where do you kind of see the market going are we, are we going to see you know more kind of artists on board onto this new medium to get their, their artwork out there we're going to see gaming take off in a big way where where do you think this is going yeah i mean I think the key point for me is it's, it's not going anywhere. It, the, it's been validated. NFTs, digital assets, utility, whatever you use them for, people realize it's important. You've seen the big brands in the world like Nike and Adidas lead out with quite interesting marketing campaigns, blended NFTs, blending in physical items. I think other people have seen that. You know, Porsche did a drop recently, uh, which was, <laughs> you know, not as successful as they hoped, but everyone's learning in, in this industry and we're seeing plenty of activity. For us, like, you know, maybe the days where people are selling huge NFTs for high value is sort of gone slightly, the hype phase. You know, I th I'm sure hype will come back, but we're seeing more active wallets engaged every day. You know, it's not as if this bear market or crypto winter is driven everyone out and they, they realize it was, you know, like, some fad, you know, like a neutral bullet or something, you know, people, are, people are still playing with these, still using them while, you know, while the market's down and the interest is still there for us. We've got a lot more creators joining every month, more artwork being created, more artwork being sold than we did previously. So I think some of the numbers, you know, are slightly misleading. It's, uh, the, the engagement is growing and, you know, I'm hoping long will it continue and as I think there's going to be obviously web 3 web 2 there's a bit of a web 2.5 a lot of big companies a lot of big industries are interested so I think it's all exciting from a nft digital assets point of view and you know I see more people owning digital assets the reddit story has been unbelievable they've onboarded like 5 million people to have crypto wallets through their avatars program and a lot of people, that's the first ever NFT that they've ever owned. If you look on June Analytics around that, it's, it's very impressive. And they've followed quite a, a plan, you know, like an NFT roadmap that they published. And they showed it's possible, you know, enough incentive, enough reason. People will create a wallet. And they've sort of worked really hard on the language. You know, not everyone wants to know what a seed phrase is, wants to understand blockchain. 
but everyone enjoys collecting stuff, whether it's real or digital. So I think there's going to be some real movement in the market that will make it easier for everyone just to collect things and enjoy collecting things without the fear of, of loss and hopefully in the future without the fear of tax obligations. I'm sure they'll have tax obligations, but they don't want to fear them. Yeah, agreed. I can't. I mean, for me, I guess what would I? What, either it's an expectation or what I can see more of is certainly gaming. Gaming is the obvious places, yeah, such a sizable industry for the implementation of this. And I think I'm just looking forward to seeing more, more utility like fractionalization, or seeing more people doing things around real estate ownership through fractionalized NFTs and, and various other aspects of it, which. I was going to say something very, I will say it, it's boring, but you know, are they then truly non-fungible or are they more fungible than they were before? We sort of then start graying the waters a bit, but I'm excited to see more of how NFTs as a utility can be implemented in, in um, a lot more of what we do. I think that's when, when kind of like mainstream adoption gets it right. Yeah. Sorry, Andy, I interrupted you uh... No, sorry. I think like in terms of industries, it's like it's difficult to see which industries wouldn't be interested in using digital assets. I mean, essentially, a digital asset can be a receipt. So, the, the you know, it's going to be used for high value items. It's going to be used for redemption, gaming items, in-game items, metaverse, virtual real estate, real real estate. You know, it's everyone's exploring it. And, and, and that's what's interesting. And you know, everyone's got to find the way with these and, and there's different markets that don't even exist yet that are going to appear and we've, we've seen that with the metaverse stuff and and then I think like the, the, the proof of attendance protocol has been really successful, you know, you know, ticketing, you, you know, it's like back when, back in the day when you're just thinking about every use case and like the ICO craze basically was like everyone shoehorning an idea from some industry into crypto. But I think in NFTs, you can prove that, you know, you don't have to pre-sell a lot of these ideas. If you can get people on board and, and, and add value to, to transactions that already exist every day, then that's where the, the true utility is going to come. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on all of that, to be honest. I, th I think for me, the, 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 the biggest area of interest is gaming. I think we, we just haven't seen like a major game developer integrate nfts yet and it's obviously on the roadmap of some of those big gaming companies and you know some of them have tens of millions of customers um and you can get to market very very quickly when you've already got that kind of level of customer base and um, so i think that's where it gets really exciting for me um it'll be a nightmare for tax <laughs> yeah i mean the most popular blockchain game at the moment is obviously the board ape uh, sewer pass Dookie Dash game, so that's really added a bit of mm. utility to their community, and obviously there's like a, a, a ticket or a key that you can sell, so there's instant liquidity, but you need to have that, and then multipliers, so they're trying to test the water really, so it's interesting to see how these things go with these engaged communities. Mm. Yeah, totally agree. Cool. So um, I just want to finish off by um, asking a few questions that have come from our community. Um, so one question is around VAT. I don't know who wants to take this one. Um, but basically, um, I'm an NFT creator. Do I need to pay VAT on sales? I know this might be a can of worms. <clears throat> so the, well, the only answer I can really give is maybe without having more of the fact so um without wanting to literally talk about this for another half an hour um it's it's an well i'd say it's an interesting area at the moment because it depends on how you're selling them it depends if you're selling through a marketplace i can tell you the difficulties uh, that, that currently exist within that because fundamentally where the vat would be applied or not depends on the underlying characteristics of what it is that you're selling because if we go back to first principles, you know, is there a good related, is there a service related? I mean, we might get to a stage in the future where it might be neither of those, but that's kind of the starting point to understand. Then we get into how it's sold. Um, what we've seen coming out of other jurisdictions, 
there was a ruling last year in Spain that sort of basically said that NFTs fell within their, um, fell within ESS, like electronically supplied services. But the difficulty with what, you know, what happens in this space is a lot of the sales are anonymous, so you don't know where your seller is, which is a huge factor for when it comes to understanding what applies. Because if you usually sold, say, 100% of everything to the US, um, from a VAT perspective, that would be outside the scope. You might have GST issues in the US, depending on what state you're selling to and various other aspects. So uh, the only thing, and, and sorry, I have to say this, but uh, you would have to probably speak to someone, an advisor within this space to learn more about what it is that you're doing and to really assess actually what the um, what the risk is in, in it related to what it is specifically that you're doing. And this comes up a lot with NFTs because they can have so many different characteristics. It's really important to understand that before any advice can be given on, on the VAT side. Yeah, from my perspective on that, I think the key is just to have an awareness that it exists, you know, that it's a possibility. Um, you know, this we don't li crypto and the crypto industry is not a utopia where stuff like VAT disappears. So I would like to encourage any creators just to try and figure it out and, and, and at least understand that there may be VAT applicable in, in whatever jurisdictions are, uh, related to them or they're doing business with. Yeah, I mean, we, we can kind of summarize the first part of this podcast of clarity and education. And, you know, perhaps we could, you know, we these people would not have an issue. Um, and again, you know, even, even advisors are struggling to navigate this, right? We do need guidance. We do need, we do need some, some real kind of advice here. Cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, um, what Ben got was another... just, like, you do sorry, but like, even Ben's answer shows how it difficult it is for a creator. How does that really help them, you know, that answer? But that is the answer, we, the only answer we can give, and we're supposed to know more than most people. And the difficulty is that exact, exactly that. At this point in time, until there's further clarity, we can go on first principles, and we might get to a position where an advisor would say, based on what you're doing, there's a high chance that that should be applied. You've then got the option of, well, okay, do we then follow that advice and we pay the VAT for each MRC to perhaps turn around in three years' time with new guidance, new legislation, and go, actually, uh, we don't think that should have applied. It's We can only go with what we know right and the rules that we have and how HMRC might seek to apply those rules, which might not be the same going forwards. And that, again, that's a real issue for anyone in the space and, and why we need that guidance and the clarity, and even us as advisors. Um, yeah tricky one yeah i've got an equally tricky one um so i'm a user that had quite a large nft collection and i was involved in a hacking incident and lost all of my assets from my wallet can i write my nfts off on my tax bill this is kind of like it's another, another we can't give you a solid well, answer say, right i mean in a <laughs> typical situation unfortunately those assets are still yours despite them being stolen so you've not really disposed of those assets yet and you know before a tax decision is made i guess there's an expectation but there's sort of some legal recourse that you could go through to try and seek recovery of those assets you know we've seen that in in the courts there was a case um with lavinia osborne persons unknown and, and ozone um where that was exactly um, effectively what happened she'd been defrauded um nfts had been taken from her wallet um so there are routes you can go down for asset recovery but unfortunately assets being stolen does not give you uh you know the ability to write them off on your tax bill because technically they're still your assets despite you not having ownership or control of them i should say sorry so ben I've got a question. Really harsh. So say, if, yeah, say if you were, say if you was hacked mm. and you had, say we had a board ape and you was hacked, and the hacker then went and disposed of the asset. Are you responsible for their disposal? I am not a legal advisor. Um, I, um, I mean, okay. I guess, it, it, and then what? I mean, that's why the, let's say, a marketplace was involved in that transaction as well, and why you know a lot of. Uh, law firms will work with marketplaces to flag stolen assets so that actually they can be aware that actually there shouldn't be an exchange of these assets because they've been stolen and defrauded so again if that were the case that's the first place that you would go 
Now, if someone had disposed of that to a third party, then they're brought into this because technically, you know, they that purchase isn't isn't a real purchase from their perspective. So everything sort of gets dragged into this. So um, whilst, again, sorry, not a legal advisor, but no, that wouldn't, you know, uh, I presume on the basis that ownership should still exist with the first person, even though that's not represented digitally, that would be something that would need to uh, more legal counsel than I can give to to understand. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think if you can prove that the assets are never recoverable, then you might have the ability to write them off. So, you know, if you had some nefarious actor that sweeped your wallet and burned your assets, I don't know why they'd ever do that. <laughs> just cruel. But they're not recoverable and just really cruel, <laughs> yeah. Um then you could probably do that. And again, if there's someone else has stolen them and done it for a third party mer marketplace and that marketplace validates that that was a third party, maybe they were KYC to somebody else, then maybe then you've got a chance of yeah. saying that they're not recoverable. Yeah. And then, I mean, you're sort of then going down the negligible value route of saying, well, actually there was an asset, then asset no longer exists. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Cool. So again, no, no clear answers, <laughs> but some principles that people need to be aware of. Yeah. Cool. Um, I've got one more question and then we'll wrap this up. And it's just how are royalties treated for tax? And I think we, we did kind of cover it, cover this. So if, if you're a creator, you've got a collection, you've got royalties baked into your contracts, you've got a drip of maybe Ethereum coming into your wallet or wrapped Ethereum coming into your wallet. How's that treated for tax purposes from a, general principles perspective effectively it's 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 well sorry andy i've been talking quite a lot it's income i would presume it's what sorry um income uh, i guess i mean we we don't we don't advise on tax but um we're obviously heavily involved in royalties and the key from the nft um creator economy is that we believe in royalties and we believe in these royalties in perpetuity. So this is a this is always going to exist and it's great. You know, this isn't a problem for creators because they're going to get paid royalties on secondary sales going forwards. But um, it, it does count as yeah, a sale, I guess. Uh, but, it's yeah. almost it's all, well, it almost acts in in a way like I'd say royalties or commission or whatever that has, but effectively it's revenue. It's 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 still income that is taxable either as income tax if you're operating as a as a sole trader in partnership or, or corporation tax if it was within a company. Yeah, I mean something hitting your wallet periodically that's coming in from something that you've done previously it feels like income right yeah. it, it's it's something that you know you would expect to probably be income um and you'd probably value that ethereum or wrapped ethereum based on the market value on the day um and you'd pay income yeah. against that i mean if you hadn't done yeah. whatever it was that you sold originally would you be receiving that value arguably not it's still eventually tied to, to, to what you've created and you're still benefiting from doing that so yeah yeah. Cool. All right. Um, we've gone through some community questions there. Thank you for doing that. Um, we're going to wrap this up now because we're, we're on to 50 minutes. Um, thank you both for coming on the podcast. Um, it's been great to get your insight on all things crypto tax sucks and NFTs. Um, so thank you thank both. You, Dan. Thanks for having us.